Uh, we are here with Sam Schaefer, who is uh, an adaptive athlete, and uh, he's got a whole backstory that we want to talk about. And then another thing that I wanted to bring up here, I've been thinking about talking to you for a while, but the post you made about um, adaptive CrossFit style competition um, uh really sort of piqued my interest. So I want to get into that too, if we can. Awesome. No, I, I appreciate it. Uh, it's a, it's a cool opportunity and it's uh, it's the type of opportunities that matter. Just like, just like every other element of sport and athlete, it's the same stuff. Right. So no, I appreciate the opportunity to hop on here today. So, um, unique to a lot of, of, of like civilians, you, uh, had an injury and end up making a decision to, actually have part of your leg removed <laughs> so how correct did, how did all that come about all right um so the quickest way to tell this long story um september 6 2011 i was active duty in the air force um i was in a career field called combat control which is a special operations branch yeah of the air force um i was in the training pipeline and i got hurt in biloxi mississippi took a fall and just a weird thing. And I developed a nerve condition called complex regional pain syndrome as a result. Um, it's basically the last diagnosis you would want if uh -huh. you're gonna, going to be like, hey, you have to choose some sort of nerve damage. This is the last one on the list. Yeah. Um, it really only gets worse. It is, it's, um, it's the wrong kind of progressively progressive. It, it sucks. It, it really fucking sucks. Um, it happens from like so, an impact style uh, injury or... Uh, it, it did for me. Um, so like mine was an impact. So I was on a run, clipped a curb, uh, basically came down. If this is my foot, heel came down, like heel touched my ankle sort of deal. Ow. In my infinite, yeah, in my infinite wisdom, adrenaline setting where I was at, got up, ran, finished the mile up that we, we had left. And well, that was the last moment uh, for the next nine years that I was out of pain. Um, Oof. so like for me, like everybody gets complex regional pain syndrome a little bit different. Like we've all got common symptoms, but it's, the proportions all change. Um, mine was constant. Uh, there was no such thing as relief for me. And it really only got worse over the course. Like I said, it was nine years. It was September 6th, 2011 was the date of my injury. I, I left the hospital on September 5th of 2020, of uh, September 5th, 2020. So almost nine full years from the day of my injury. Um, was wow. when my amputation occurred. Wow. Um, it was just one of those things that it just kept getting worse. And there was, there was no path forward that I hadn't tried yet. This was the only thing left. This was my last chance at treatment. Um, I mean, I was coaching at a CrossFit gym and I'm having to use a forearm crutch to walk around all day um, because I can't handle that. Anything single leg loaded was terrible. It, it just sucked. Uh, it, it, it owned every part of my life. I didn't do anything. I couldn't, you know, you just couldn't. And then, so for me, it was just like the next step was like, well, if I get this amputation, uh, it's either going to fix it, which is fucking great. Mm. Or I'm going to be right where I'm at. I was headed for a wheelchair anyway. I knew that. Um, cause there was a chance they're like, Hey, we could cut this off and you could wake up and nothing changed. You could feel all the same shit. And I was like, I know like at that point I was so, I, I was ready. I just wanted a chance to change. I just wanted the opportunity to make progress so bad. Um, that I was literally willing to trade my leg in for it. Do um, they give you a, a percentage of a success or a percentage of relief? Oh no, making that decision. Oh or no, they, they can't. They can't really no. stamp nothing. They can't. Yeah. They can't. They wouldn't. And uh, most of them said they wouldn't even do it. Uh, I got. I. It was a knockdown, drag out fight between myself and the and the VA. Unfortunately, before wow. I eventually got a referral out of the VA. Um, and it was with the surgeon, honestly, I should have been sent to from the very beginning. This is the only guy that should have done my operation. Uh. Um, he did a, I got unbelievably lucky, so grateful that I got set up with this surgeon um, who really did an, a very not run of the mill amputation. Um, he knew, he knew what I planned to do with this thing. Um, so he's like, I'm going to put him in the best position. He happens, this happens to be a passion project for him. Almost nobody on earth is trying to treat complex regional pain syndrome. He is. Um, and he just happened to also be in St. Louis. So I got so freaking fortunate with that. Um, cause he, he did nerve work in there. It was a nine hour surgery. It was literally the first surgery of my life. And I was out for nine hours, woke up and shit didn't hurt anymore. How do you even go about like beginning to make that decision? Like, is it just, 
nine years of excruciating um, pain that like forced it? Is it you're flipping a coin? Are you playing fucking you know video games and letting your mind wander till you come across a decision? Um, a little bit of all of the above. Um, the coin flip, huh? Me, That's how I'd roll. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, I'd say probably less. The coin flip. Fair, fair. I'm definitely, I'm definitely, I'm definitely a thinker. Um, so I, I, I examined all the angles. I examined what I might be giving up, what I might like. I didn't. It wasn't a light decision, but it also had nine years of data behind it. Yeah. What more do? What more did I really need to know? Mm. Um, at that point, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm 30. I'm not going to be in better shape in five years if this is where it has to go anyway. Mm. I'm not going to be in better shape to recover from this. Like, why fucking? Why not just fucking do it? My like, I was in a. I was in a terrible spot mentally, but like, I'm just so fortunate that I was able to keep my mind clear enough to think it out and just go and just be willing to say yes to the next opportunity of progress. Cause I had tried I, you know, all the therapy. I had tried so many therapies and different modalities and different training styles. And, you know, I learned a ton because of it and it made me the coach that I am. Um, but you know, and I'm lucky to get to be, still be using that, but man, like it was, it was one of those ones like, yeah, I had, again, I, I had, and not only did I have nine years of data, I experienced every second of the data. I wasn't reading it. Um, like, if you're listening to me today, you're probably going to get my whole story in a, in a one hour window. I, I experienced that second by second. Right. Um, mm. So, so for me, it was just, it was just the next step forward. It was just to, like, if you want to keep walking towards progress, you're going to have to cut this thing off. You, like, uh, you mentioned uh, progress. I was good with that. You mentioned progress multiple times. Is that? Um for you everything is that physical were you were you competitive before that uh, obviously you know running in the military background and you mentioned crossfit um what what's like driving that so hard was it that you wanted to yeah get fitter that you wanted to compete i just want better i just want i'm fascinated like like i am so fascinated by the human machine to be honest and like this is like a recent epiphany of mine like uh i got in like I got it. CrossFit was my introduction. That was, you know, I was the classic, you know, this is February, 2010. This is pre rich froning. Yeah. You know, it's this underground viral thing. I know you guys are pretty aware of it. Uh, yeah. yeah what, I mean, it was out CrossFit back in the Santa Cruz, you know? So like we saw it super. <laughs> yeah. Early. yeah. It, exactly. So, um, I got, I got lucky there, but like, so that was my first like intro to train to like lifting or whatever. I played soccer in high school and was idiotically told, Oh no, lifting's not good for soccer. You don't, don't do that. Yeah, it slows you down. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see exactly, I know, right? Yeah, you don't want to be slow. I was, I, I was, because I was overwhelming with speed already um, <laughs> as a four eleven white kid uh, freshman year. Um, <laughs> but so that kind of introduced me to like trying to push the machine in multiple different directions and not just being like, don't just be a one trick pony. And that always stuck with me because of what I wanted to do with the military. You know, I had those aspirations to spend six to 10 years in there and then get out. Um, yeah. two and a half, unfortunately is what I did. Um, and then from there, like I moved into weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting is like, cause I could set my feet and it wasn't as much impact, but I got the challenge that I liked out of just the movement, being able to apply movement at higher intensity. And so I always kind of thought, you know, then I got into Highland games, um, you know, trying all those things. And what I've realized is I'm just fascinated by control of control of what you can control. Um, and there's just a lot of progress to make there. And if I can just keep that progress train rolling, what's really going to get in my way. Like at that point, that's the ultimate building block of confidence to me is just continuing to make progress. Like I know that I can learn these things. I know I can figure it out. So yeah. So to me, progress is the big driving factor. And then a competition field is just a place to put it into play. Um, trophies and placements are cool. Probably. I don't know. I've never won anything that big, um, that important, but like I said, for me, it's just like, I'm driven by the opportunity to make progress and get better at something. Um, because that's more mastery of, that's more mastery of the machine that I was given. What did uh training look like for those nine years going through pain and, and trying all these different diagnoses oh, or man. different, uh, uh, modalities and stuff? Were you, were you able to get some stuff down where you, you just turned into a curl bro like me, just sitting in the squat rack, building biceps? What it, what it, what it look like? Um, no, I stayed, I was always very performance driven. That was, that was the only thing that interested me. So my weightlifting total was never big, but I was just shy of a 250 kilo total. So I've my I think my best clean and jerk is 141, and that was on a bum leg. And then snatch 244. I think those were my best lifts. Um, 
I built the squat and deadlift up pretty well. You know, once that got to a point that I couldn't really do that, I got a little bit more into uh, training a little bit more. I learned a lot about conjugate method through my coach, Tom Soroka, who's uh, got a weightlifting gym up in uh, Chicago. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you guys know. Okay, so Tom was a great intro for me. And from there, you know, we I was pulling over five, you know, I was pulling 550 on a regular basis. Mm. He helped me get my squat up to five before my surgery. Um, and yeah, so like I got like, I still stayed in the competition sp- and like the performance driven space. It was more, it just kept, it kept having to evolve. I, every time I get into something, something else would deteriorate and I couldn't do it anymore. And I just had to move to the next, like I got real big into the sandbag stuff, like especially over with COVID. I didn't, I didn't have a gym set up. So I was like, I was like, I'm not going to go fight people to pay twice double the weight for two pairs of dumbbells. I'm going to go buy a sandbag that I can just do everything with. And I got to the point that I could, you know, as a moderately sized dude, I could pick up a, I got to the point that I could pick up a uh, 300 pound bag. Um, it's like the sandbag stuff was really good. You know, I just tried everything, man. Like nothing, there's, there's no wrong there. I just finally realized like there's no wrong answer. Like there's lots of ways to get strong. You don't, in the end, you don't need a barbell. You don't need a sandbag. You just need something. You mentioned and so for me, I just looked at everything as a vehicle for that. You mentioned your mental state. It had to have been um, very difficult to just keep going and not have a like definitive answer or a solution. And, and just the – like you, s- sleeping when you're in a lot of pain is a really difficult thing. And the less you sleep, the, more, the less you cope. And, uh, and it just gets a spiral. It, it just gets harder and harder. Like how did you get through that? I don't all the way know that yet, to be honest. Um, Like, to be honest, I still have yet to completely unpack that, how I actually did that. I just, I'm just grateful that I did. Um, uh, You know, last, you know, I've been with my wife a few years and I know that like she came in like at the worst time ever to come into my life. Like I couldn't have been in worse shape. I still to this day, thank her for sticking with me and, and baffled by the fact that she stayed with me to be honest, or was even interested in starting a relationship with somebody that was in a place like that. Um, cause it, you're right. I didn't sleep for nine years. Um, like sleep was completely gone. Uh, the, it was just constant pain. There was just nothing I could do to make progress. Like, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm this person that's very progress driven yeah. and I can't do anything like, ever, like I am like busting my ass day in and day out, learning, tr- applying, training, and just I'm all I'm doing is I'm trying to keep the rock from falling back down the hill as slow as possible. Like I, I never got to move the rock forward in that, in those nine years. And that was just really draining. And like it, it brought me to like, yeah, I, I went real bad place, re- real bad place, spent time with th- split time with therapy. Um, the whole nine, like I, I all, all the, all the mental health struggles happened and it, it got to a pretty dangerous place at one point. And, um, that, that was the night that I, I knew that I was like, I cut it off or get it, get it cut off or cut it off yourself. If something's got to, something has to happen. Like there, there, there is no, there's no choice to make anymore. Um, I, I knew after, I knew after that point, like there, there's no choice to make. Like I, you know, the, cause then there's other elements. Like you start to feel guilt. Like I felt guilty that this was such a meaningful part of my wife's life. Like what, like that, there's no reason for that. Like, I didn't want her to have, like, it, it just felt unfair. And like, I just, I couldn't give back to her anywhere close to what she could give to me. And I, I attribute to her as a big reason why now I'm finally getting in a position to finally give back to her a little bit. Um, but no, it was, it was rough, man. Like, <laughs> like it, it's, it's, it's hard to really like sum it up to into words, especially just only being, I'm only like, like I said, so I'm less than a year and a half on the other side of a nine year constant battle with pain. So I'm still like, I'm just finally starting to understand my brain space and all this stuff. Like I remember waking up out of surgery and my brain just didn't know what to do. Cause it was the first time it wasn't processing, not just like a little bit of pain, but like massive pain. Like it was, it was wild. Like, and it, it has been, it's been like the most fun and cool part of this journey has been finally getting is earning my way to the other side. Yeah, I mean, thank you for for talking about that. I know it's probably not easy to to discuss that uh, that kind of a journey. Um, you know, I think that probably all of us on a daily basis kind of live for hope. You know, mm-hmm. and when you don't necessarily feel like you have any, it, it it 
it makes it very difficult, I'm sure. I I just always believed that like at minimum I can be my best. And I wasn't happy with how good my best was, yeah. but I knew how much less happy I'd be with being the second best version of me. And I want to say that I freaking like, I heard that one day watching like a fight, like an old UFC fight, like ultimate fighter. And some guy said something like that. And I just, yeah, <laughs> fucking yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, that, that makes moment. so much sense. It's weird and, how that uh, works. That, like inspirations mm-hmm. like that come out from, from, unexpected places i guess all the time yeah it's a valuable time to have to have heard that and um that was really what i mean i just i believed in the fact that i could be my best and also the reality was i'm not the first person to get to the other side of that journey um so i maybe i looking back i've realized how much confidence i found in that like you know what I'm not reinventing the wheel to get out of this. I just have to, I just have to hang in there and keep showing up. Um, something I, you know, tell my athletes, like if you're, you're feeling off, I give you a hint every day you show up, that's it. That's you giving yourself an opportunity to break the slump. Like that's always the opportunity. You know, every day that you show up, you have the opportunity to have the PR day. So I just, I just had to keep showing up and I wish to, wished I wouldn't have had to show up as many days as I did, but I don't, I don't get to make that choice. And, well, it was all where every single choice was worth it. So that's what that's, you know, like I said, I think that that was a big guiding light for me um, when things were real dark. And now uh looks like you're trying to step into the competitive ish scene again or, or, or form some of that <clears> stuff <throat> with CrossFit. Yeah. How did that kind of come about? Um, I didn't know. And maybe you can correct me if they have had uh, an official, like an adaptive category for a long time but i do know it's been like a part of the culture for a very long time um i've met multiple athletes you know dealing with reebok and crossfit over the last decade um that are involved in the community in in various ways um that have gone through similar you know journeys as yourself and we even had a training partner like that shout out my boy bryce um lost his leg at his hip and everyone's obviously stories a little bit different yeah and so you know you're talking about trying to deadlift and trying to he doesn't he doesn't even wear his prosthetic because it's so high up it's doesn't even help them it's yeah yeah different animal everyone everyone's journey slightly different but the same as you know any athlete you got to figure out your leverages and in your way across things but how's that how'd that kind of come about for you um is it just your itch to be competitive or or what's that look like um yeah so there's definitely a competitive itch there um i at at 32 i feel like i'm just getting started and i'm like fuck it i'm doing it like let's go uh, all the way So, so there's that and then the reality is crossfit probably has the most abundant opportunity at this point, unfortunately, because it's not because, so that's kind of where some of the disconnect between like the adaptive community and CrossFit is right now with where the competitive scene is, is they've used, you know, the, you know, adaptive athletes in part as their marketing for the open for years and years and years, but we were never allowed to play until last year. Mm. Like, so like, man, you guys have sold a whole bunch of these tickets without letting us buy one, without even letting us buy one. Um, but so like I've been involved in CrossFit since 2010. Um, when I came back from the military and got back into it, cause I was like, well, fuck it. Everything else hurts. I'm going to do something I enjoy and hurt instead of doing, instead of eliminating everything mm-hmm. and hurting. Um, I was, so I was like, again, what do I have to lose? It was kind of like the wheelchair discussion. I'm going to get, I'm going to end up there anyway. Um, if I don't do anything. So so I got into the competitive thing and was and did competitions and you know I tried hard on you know tried hard on the open you know aspiring regional athlete maybe for a year or two you know in terms of like what that was truly like interesting and would light my fire and around 2016 the nerve damage had gotten so bad I got it basically said nope we're not doing this anymore like it it was too much pain to come off of a pull up bar like mm. that impact was would spiral for days uh, much less jumping rope or anything like that. So I never really actually anticipated that I would come back to CrossFit competition. Like I had made peace with that. Like that was a part of the discussion that I had with myself. Like if this doesn't happen, is that okay? And my answer was yes. I'm not cutting my leg off to go do competitive CrossFit. Um, now, since I've gotten back, you know, it was crazy. You know, I got to do a uh, Wadapalooza. So I was in Miami back in J- this past January and 
Uh, I was a part of the first ever all adaptive team to qualify for and compete in a, uh, in a major CrossFit event in the able-bodied category. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so wow. me and two, yeah. So I had, two, there was two other amputees, um, that invited, that asked me like, Hey, we want to go out and make this statement and we'd love for you to be a part of it. Uh, so I got really fortunate that I, I, I walked out to the floor for the, uh, second event and I realized like, Holy shit, this is a return. I never thought I was going to make. Yeah. Like, like that was my first time on the floor since 2016 and fuck, did it feel like home, man? It was so good to just find a piece of myself out there. And I was like, yeah, we're going for it now. Um, so it just, like I said, it's what lights the fire right now. So I'm having fun with it. Um, I'm interested in what can happen. And like I said, it's a very new division. So it's very, it's very much developing and unfolding before our eyes. And it reminds me a lot of the early days of CrossFit that I was a part of. And I remember watching all that stuff get figured out. So it's very reminiscent to me of that 2012 ish era where things were really, where people were starting to figure things out, but they didn't have it there yet. Like nowhere close to what we have today. Um, and just by sheer participation, enough people running the play basically that we were able to make more and more adjustments and learn how to coach better and how to program better. And, um, the adaptive spaces that that's where they're at right now. Like from my perspective is that we just, we need more people. We need people to run the play. And then on top of that, from an opportunity standpoint, the more numbers we build, the bigger opportunities a company's going to give us. Um, that is that simple. Um, I'm not real. I'm not a big fan of saying, Hey, give me this opportunity, but I am saying like, Hey guys, we can, if, if these numbers go up, that's us sending a message and that's us telling them like, Hey, it's time to go. And so like I said, it's a very new competition. Last year was the very first time that there was an adaptive division that, you know, athletes could sign up for. Is that um, at the games or is that at uh WADA? Cause I know WADA has an insane amount of like classes and stuff. Or yeah. So, so, the Wadapal- so, so Wadapal- so I was talking about the games. So Wadapalooza is, Definitely. They were like the pioneers and like, Hey, we're going to bring adaptive athletes and give them a place to compete. I want to say 2015 or 2016 yeah. was the first year they did that. Um, one of the guys that was on my team, Marcus was a part of that very first one. Um, so it was really cool that he got to be then a part of the first adaptive team to go able-bodied. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, so, but from the CrossFit games last year was the first year they had the adaptive class and they did it similar to how they do the age categories in terms of like, when did you compete? What workouts did you do? Um, they were, it was very much in line with how they handle the other categories, other like age group categories and stuff like that. So like I said, this is year two. How would you like to see them approach it? And what, what are they not doing that you wish they were doing and vice versa? That's a good question. Um, so really it's a matter of, there needs to be better better communication in general. Hmm. Uh, it was very clear last year how just by how many different interpretations of the same information we got that it what the things weren't communicated clear. They were it didn't seem like they understood. They didn't seem like there was a big effort to understand what the adaptive division is um, hmm. and why classifications matter and things like that. Like for example, you're talking about your buddy missing. You know, he's a hip hip dysartic. Um, that an above knee amputee and then a below knee amputee like myself, those are three different yeah. things to, to, to account for in terms yeah. of like, how are we going to make this a fair, even competition across the board? Um, so with time, like we, we need to know that they are looking to add more classes. Um, but also like, we want to see, like, it's a kind of, like you said, there's like this imbalance of like, I know that we are brand new and that we don't have, you know, we don't have a hundred thousand adaptive athletes signing up for the open, but it's also this, uh, this imbalance where there's a lot of people in the community that have watched themselves be, like, they're like, yeah, I've been in a CrossFit video. I, they, they used me to advertise the open. They mm-hmm. didn't let me sign up for it five years ago, six years ago. And so there's like this imbalance of like, yes, we're new, but like at the same time, it's very clear that CrossFit's been very aware that it was going on. But so it's kind of confusing to me more. I would just love some communication more than anything. Like, cause a lot of people want to take it or taking it personally. Cause they're like, man, like, you know, you've used me for this long and now it's my time to go. And now there's, you know, only three classes went to the CrossFit games last year, um, lower, upper and neuromuscular. So the seated division didn't go short stature, didn't go. There's a few, uh, neuro, uh, 
Um, no, Nero went. Um, but so there's stuff like that going on. So I would just more, more than anything, I would just love clear communication. Like, Hey, these classes, you're going to get a spot at the games when your registration gets to these numbers or like, I, I want to know that there's thought being put into it. Like, I don't know what it looks like, to be honest. And I'm not going to pretend like I know what it's like to program or organize the CrossFit games. I mean, I mean, the reality is last year, um, my impre- my understanding was that we were told there would be no CrossFit games for the adaptive year one. You know, they had to kind of figure it out and they actually ended up sending 30 athletes, um, that got an opportunity to compete, win money, um, the whole nine. So like more than anything, there just needs to be, clear communication. Um, it, and like I said, that's more than anything. It's just, it's communication in terms of like, what can I say? Like, cause I just don't know what CrossFit's thinking. Um, I've got no understanding of this and I've been watching CrossFit operate since 2010. Um, it is definitely more confusing on this side of the table, um, that this go around compared to what it used to be. Is any of the problem just around around numbers? I mean, like just having enough athletes to to stand up a division or a group of divisions, or or there is that element. Like, so there is the element of we have to build the pool. Like, um, like, and I and I'm all, I'm all with that. Like, I, I'm not. I don't want anything special. Um, I'm not somebody like I'm not asking. I don't want special treatment, but I want to understand your commitment. Like. Because like there is nobody else that is really giving adaptives an opportunity to kind of pave their way like this, mm-hmm. which is a part of what's really got me interested and really has got me fired up. And I, I feel like this is this is the vehicle for the adaptive community. You know, everything that CrossFit's about could not be more important to, the, to these sections of, of uh, humans. So it's like I said, so it's really just about this. Um, so for us. That's what I see. I see that what can I do, what controlling what I can control, I can try to get, get people to sign up. I can make people aware. Like I had somebody comment on the, on the post that I made this past weekend that had you guys reach out to me. You know, I had a couple of people like, I didn't even know that they did the adaptive division. I'm going to sign up now. Hmm. That's what we need. Like, yeah. like more than anything, it's, it, well, from the athlete's perspective, it's awareness. It, it's awareness and it's encouragement. We need to be inviting and bring people in and give these people the opportunities. So there's, Again, I'm big on controlling what I can control. I, in the end, I can't control HQ. I can't control what CrossFit does. Um, things are only becoming more difficult to understand by the day in terms of CrossFit HQ in the last year or so. So I'm not going to pretend like like the path to victory here is by waiting around to see what they're going to do. Uh, that's that To me, that's a fool's errand. Um, I don't think we're going anywhere like that. So... Whether we like it or not, it's on us to build the numbers um, because numbers don't lie. I don't uh, have any clue what it takes to run an event of the, the game's level. You know, I never have, never will. Um, not a passion of mine to run that Man, style of event. I sit there and I, I hope I never get that bug. Man, yeah, do I hope yeah, I never yeah. get that bug. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's cool to be a part of it, but I'm not trying to be the head guy. But um, I can understand how, you know, people you know or other athletes – kind of get upset at being used for marketing yet the transparency isn't there and to me it it is a simple answer just like everything in life and i'm gonna sound like some fucking stupid dating guru or something but like just have (laughs) just have a conversation right why don't they just reach out to three athletes get them in hq sit them down with three organizers of the games and say hey what does some of this stuff look like that we could do with you or without you or with your opinions to build out these classes or to build out this competition or or just straight up numbers hey we're going to need a hundred below the knee amputees to compete in the open to then get a 30 person category you know what i mean like when you do stuff like that then then it doesn't feel like it is uh an optics thing and and in like you said not only in crossfit but across the world in more recent years everything feels like optics yeah like what what are you really doing here bro Mm -hmm. Are are you trying to run an event or are you just trying to look good you know for your instagram right now no that's it Dead on, man. Dead, like dead, that is dead and on. And I'm about to get kicked out of the CrossFit Games for the <laughs> second time. Yeah. Well, well, if, if that's any indication, then I'll I'll, I'll be with you. Um, <laughs> but, but no, but I mean, that, and the kicker is like, and the worst part of it that I think that that really has frustrating is there's already organizations that have been there's a couple of organizations that are already doing this stuff. Like for example, uh, there's an organization called Wheelwad. Um, they have been like the forefront to my, to my understanding, you know, I'm, I'm coming in late to the game. Like I'm, 
again, super fortunate. Um, I'm about as fortunate as a human can be who had to make the decision to cut their leg off. Like I, I fully acknowledge all this. There's a lot of work that's already been done. I'm, I'm coming in and I'm just offering to pick up the rock and carry the rock for a little bit. Like there's already guys that have already been doing work. Wheel wide is one of them. Um, they, they do like, they have their wheel wide games. That was a couple months after the CrossFit games. Like the CrossFit games was like a six, six event thing, I think for the adaptive athletes, six or seven, not, not nothing, no, no complaints there or anything. Wheel wide ran like a 13 or 14 event more similar to the CrossFit games. Yeah. Um, they ran something more similar to that in terms of volume. So it's been, so they've proven that that can be done. They've proven that there are athletes that can handle this. There's, you know, that information, there is some amount of that information to start with. They don't, they're not starting from a blank slate. And I, and I I don't know, again, from a transparency standpoint, I don't know how much of that information was really utilized this past year. And I don't know how much of it's been used in the last year, to be completely honest. Like that's the, I think that's where, you know, so people that have been, you know, fighting this fight for a little while and I have the advantage that I don't have years of frustration built up on this. Um, you know, they've been a part of, you know, like we have figured all these things out. Why come, why aren't we just using that information and moving forward together with it? So they're like, again, if that's happening, I, I'm not aware of it or, and no one that I've spoken to seems to be aware of it. So if they are doing all these things we're talking about, this much transparency makes a whole lot of people feel a whole lot better. Um, so like I said, so if they're doing all these things, fuck yes. And I'm excited that that's cool. And that's exactly what I, that's the path that I believe. That's a path that I believe in that represents from an action standpoint, we are all trying to do our best. Um, it felt a little token optic last year. And again, I don't know that that's true. I wasn't there. Um, but I do know that I have not really spoken to many athletes that have been in the community for a little while that feel differently. Um, you're trying to concentrate on, on things you can actually do and change. You work with other uh, adaptive athletes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So n- not on any sort of big scale. It's, um, it's all very new to me. I'm just still, I'm, I'm starting to figure out my own stuff and learning how to verbally explain it. But yes, mm-hmm. I am, uh, I'm working on that for sure. I'm the, I'm the head coach at my CrossFit gym now, so I get the advantage that I'm coaching all day. Uh, I'm, I'm again, I'm, again, I'm coaching all day. I'm talking to athletes. I'm working with athletes. I'm figuring things out. And to me, this is just another another path to walk down. How do you um, how do you actually assess what what you think somebody's going to be capable of, and and how you keep them safe in in a CrossFit env- environment? Like what what are you looking for and looking at? Um, so th- th- yeah, that's a, there's a whole can of worms there. So yeah. there's a handful of things that have to, it's, it's a matter of, so it starts with figuring out where they're starting from. Like I got my amputation. I knew it was coming. Mm-hmm. I was physically prepared for it. I was mentally prepared for it. I had 10 over 10 years of training. Well, like movement quality, like I have spent so much time learning things about movement mechanics from my, from guys like Chris Duffin and their content and all that. Um, so I got, I got, I got, I got to walk in with all of that. Uh, it was really cool. Like I was again, super fortunate, very grateful that you guys have been coaching and doing lifting and stuff like that for a while. And you guys know exactly how, if you could start an athlete from day zero, you know exactly what you would do, right? Like they no learning curve. I got to put all of that to the test. I got to be athlete zero. I got to do that for myself. And it was the coolest, coolest thing ever. It's been the most rewarding. I've gotten to prove every concept that I believe in in the full 360 degrees. I kind of feel similar to Kelly Sturette with his knee rehab. Um, I thought it's been so cool that he's been able to prove everything that he's, he, he's like, this is what happens when you run my play exactly. This is what, this is how well it can work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it starts with just figuring out where they're at. Um, and then depending on the impairment, like, and the other thing is I don't have anything else going on. So like, for me, amputation was a solution. For some people, it was a response to like a car accident and maybe like, so they lost their foot, but their knee or their hip is all jacked up as well. Okay. So there's multi- there could be multiple, so it's learning those sorts of things. It's learning their starting point and then figuring out their athleticism and just what they're already working with. And then at that point, they're still just an athlete. It's a matter of learning how to communicate with them. So like for me, as it are, being a fellow amputee, I can communicate with another amputee really well because 
I know what it feels like to wear a prosthetic. I know what I know what a deadlift, and I've also got this advantage that I know what a good deadlift feels like, able bodied. Right. So I was able to translate that over to my prosthetic, and then just learn how to create the same sensations and engagement. And what I've learned is that our movement doesn't really change as adaptive athletes, um, especially depending on the, the lower side of things. Like upper, doing everything single arm is obviously different, but well. People have been training unilaterally for a very long time. Now you just, everything's unilateral if you're an upper. Um, but the deadlift mechanics don't change. You know, so I'm still teaching them to deadlift. It's now, it's more that the margin for error shrinks. So like if you guys think about you guys deadlifting, um, there's certain, you can get away with certain things, especially if it's under a certain percent, right? Mm-hmm. And like you can lose a certain amount of balance and still complete a good, clean, safe lift. That window, as I became an amputee, shrank. I basically just had to actually just become a better athlete. I had to become a, a, I had to execute better. And so for me, that's my big thing. When I go to, when I'm talking to these athletes that are asking me, you know, what, why Schaefer Adaptive Methods got started was I had guys that were, I got guys that are out there deadlifting over 500 on a prosthetic, sending me a message saying, how are you doing this? I want to learn how you're deadlifting. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You've been an amputee for like a decade. I've been in one for like six months. Like it, so that, that became real apparent to me that, okay, at a certain point, like enough people have knocked on the door. It's time to build something. So like for me, that's what it's about. It's about learning to, it's about learning how to be disciplined in your execution because that's how I'm going to stay healthy, safe, long-term. Like, and to me, I see execution as the long-term plan, like how you're doing your deadlift. You're not doing sloppy reps. You're not doing this, that, or the other that creates that wear and tear. Because again, as an adaptive athlete, that wear and tear has a greater impact on their quality of life. Um, there, there's, so there's a handful, of, and from there, it's so like I said, so movement is still movement, and then it's a matter of learning how to translate it. So I think that if you're a, not an adaptive, if you are not an adaptive athlete who's seeking to coach adaptive athletes, or you want to be of service to this community and you want to share what you know, you need to get very. You need to be good at your language and learning how to educate your athlete to communicate their sensations to you. So, like they can tell you what that felt like, and then okay, now you can learn. So then now you can work with them. Like so, this is what we're going for, and you know we can make those adjustments. And that's like so you have to get good at educating your athlete on how to communicate to you, um, so they can understand what their hamstring feels like, what their glute feels like, what pressure in the front part of their pro- of their device versus the back part of their device, and all that feels like. Um, because that's like one of the big things, like for me, that's changed is like my midfoot. I got real, I got, I got pretty good at like finding midfoot on my movements, you know, pulls, squats, whatever. My midfoot has, my midfoot on my, on my right side, my sound side, my midfoot is different in a different place than it is on my prosthetic. That midfoot kind of moves back. So you got to adjust the stance a little bit and things like that to line the mid to find that symmetry. And, like, and at that point, like I said, you just have to be very strong in your movement, understanding, and your language. Yeah, you even mentioned you obviously lifted for a very, very long time before um, having to deal with the prosthetic and stuff. That seems, if you know the sensation of, of, you know, loading your hamstrings or whatever, yeah, you could probably kind of figure it out on your own. But, yeah, what about adaptive athletes that have never trained, like with a barbell? You know, they're mm-hmm. maybe, maybe they had no fitness at all, or they had like the typical gym experience where they're on machines. Like that seems um, incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to train someone who's never trained before. You know, and now they're in their thirties. Maybe they're not a high school or college athlete, and trying to get them to move their body through space with load isn't an easy task by any means. No, and I was I was just fortunate. I'm really well equipped. Uh, my passion for training i've never aspired to coach a crossfit games athlete i love working with the everyday person like i so i'm constantly working with the, with that population anyway so to, again it's it's about translating it um i was had a, a great conversation with a buddy a few months back and because he was teaching me how to skateboard and he was like you got to listen to your feet so he's like i don't know what the fuck you're gonna do for this because <laughs> you've only got one to listen to i was like and then we kind of came to the we kind of came to this like conclusion that it's, it's translating a language, but it's not translating from English to Spanish. Right. It's like, imagine, imagine if every noise that your dog makes is no different than every noise that I'm making right now. That's what I'm translating it to. Like, that's, that's how I could translate, or that's what the translation process is from able-bodied 
to lifting in a prosthetic for me. Like that, that's what it's felt like is like, I'm happy. I've just had to learn a completely new language of movement. Um, that isn't based on anything that I was familiar with, uh, before. For but yourself, the truth is still the truth. For yourself and for other athletes you work with, you know, able or not, um, the, uh, that sense of mastery that people get, like that satisfaction you see in their face, that's got to be very rewarding. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I, there's nothing cooler than having somebody just sit there and have this light bulb go off that, oh, I can do things. I did. I, there's way more options in my life than I realized. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was the whole point of me cutting my leg off. Like, I, I told my surgeon, I was like, you cut my leg off, I'm going to be on a skateboard in a year. I've never skateboarded before, but I'm going to figure it like, like he was just like, well, we don't have to start there, but okay. <laughs> yeah, that's where I give a lot of confidence. <laughs> you know what? I think he, I, I got really lucky. Like I said, he, uh, he realized who I was, and he realized that um, I'm not the guy he's got to work that he needs to worry about. Like, uh -huh. like I, it, it was. He realized that like I had aspirations that were far outside the the bell curve, but I wasn't coming in half cocked. Um, Again, he realized that, again, I'm a thinker and I plan stuff out and I think about what I'm doing and what I'm saying and how I'm doing it. So I got to get in. He was really, he was like, well, I hope nothing. He basically, I, I feel like he was just like, I hope nothing bad happens. <laughs> I really do. Because <laughs> because my amputation is kind of his masterpiece as well. Uh -huh. So that, that had to have been a really odd sensation the first time you put on a, a, a prosthetic and the first time you try to stand yeah. and walk uh and and sort of regain your like normal mobility what what was that like for you well that's that's the kind of the thing that i look back to and i see like this is like that that language translation i explained yeah it was the start of that i realized like man i know all the right words but none of them matter like this is no, there is just it was just weird. It was different, but it was also incredibly freeing. I just spent nine years in pain and then three months on the couch waiting for the surgery to heal before mm -hmm. they would let me get into a prosthetic. So it was it was freeing. Like it was unreal. Like you know, like in the movie where like it like they, the wind comes and like oh my god, you know everything's <laughs> different. Like th there was no fan in there, but it felt like it. Like I was just like holy shit. I just remember standing up the first time and I'm just like fuck. This is the first time in three months I've been upright, upright. Yeah, this is the shit. And I got both hands fucking neat. Like it was just, it was just, it was an overwhelming, it was overwhelming emotions of just like, fuck yes. Like this is, this is why we did this. This is why we showed up. This is why, why I wanted to do this. Um, it's why I was, it's what I felt that I was working towards. Oh, There's awesome. really no way to describe the sensation because you'd have to have, because basically what happened is, that part of my body had to learn to be a brand new body part. Um, like, like the way they, the way that amputation goes, it's like, so they, they, the incision will happen like right in the front, but then they're going to cut down and they're going to fold the calf forward. Okay. To create like, they're going to, so they want to use all that muscle mass. So like there was parts of my like residual limb that's like right here in the front that, that what it knows is being down by the Achilles tendon. Oh, so like, so like exactly, you have a whole new world, whole whole new world in that regard. But um, yes, yeah, so like that's uh, the yeah the way to describe it is it's indescribable basically. <laughs> the sensation associated with that must have been so weird to adapt. Oh to. yeah, yeah yeah. Well, I mean, all I'd felt down there for so long was pain. That it was like, man, this is just so new. everything about it was new. It didn't hurt. It was it, again. It was I, I grew a new body part. That's awesome. We got the uh, CrossFit Open in a couple of weeks here. Um, you got plans to do it, coach it, compete in it. What's, oh, that, what's it look like for you all as an above. athlete? Yeah, all, all all the above. Yeah, I got uh, my, my gym gets my gym gets into it, but not in like the we're going to go to the games way. Um, we we've got we do a really we do the in house thing. Uh, we have a lot of fun with like just an in house competition. Um, we just like I said, we we've got a community that likes to do stuff together. You know, it's it's the if you don't realize that's the magic of, of a CrossFit affiliate, then you're missing the, then like your affiliate doesn't get it. Um, that's, that's what's special about it. Um, so yeah, so we get into like the in-house stuff. So that's going to be fun because I didn't get to participate for a long time. Like I, I actually, I'm the one in my gym that started the intramural open. 
and then was very quickly ousted by my nerve issue and didn't get to participate yeah. anymore. So I'm excited to get the get back into the fold and any excuse to shit talk the other coaches is always a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, as an athlete, I am pretty excited about it. I I don't know how well I'll do this year, um, but I do feel very confident that by next year, I'm, I'm really confident in what I and the work I can get done in the next year because this whole first year has been a lot of fluctuation and. You know, it's like you can train, I can train for a week and then like I keep shrinking. Like I've gone through, I'm on my seventh uh, socket already. So as wow. you're in a constant state of atrophy. Uh, so eventually as you shrink enough, your socket loses stability and you have to get a new one made. And I, I shrank so fast that like I kept losing like the stability to the point like, hey, if you keep training on it, you're going to hurt your residual limb. So like I actually, lo- I didn't really get to train near as much as I would have liked to in the last year. So I've not done the work to sit there and be like, I'm going to the games. Um, but I am, I'm going all in. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go hard on all three workouts, um, see what happens and where, where the chips fall, they fall. Uh, last year I did the open and I had been in a leg for almost three months. So like, I'm still learning how to walk and like the first workouts got jump rope and I was like, Oh, well, I guess we're going to learn how to jump today. Uh, and that, but that, but that's the beauty. And again, that's the beauty of the CrossFit. And that's why I wanted to do it because it's going to put me in a position to have to learn those skills and learn how to do them well and not just survival. So it'll be fun. I think I was, you know, somewhere around 30th, thir- mid thirties in the world last year in my, in the lower division. And the reality is I half at, like I didn't, I didn't go hard in the workouts because I wasn't in a position where it was safe for me to do that. And I was, I wasn't about to sell out down the road for trying real hard in, in a in a competition that I wasn't prepared to try real hard on. Um, this year, I'm a lot I'm a lot more ready. You know, I, I've done so much in the last year. Even if I didn't get all the training in, you know, I'm already back. To, I'm throwing Highland Games again already. Uh, I'm actually going to be competing at the Arnold, um, oh, throwing awesome. the record breaker. Yeah, throwing record breaker event um, for for wow. adaptive Highland Games. So like getting to do all that sort of stuff has still helped a lot. And like I said, I just feel good, man. I just, things are finally starting to stabilize, stabilize out and I can, I can just work harder and I can have more. And that's fun to me. Um, the pursuit of progress is, is, it's genuinely enjoyable for me. So that's what I'm getting to do now. Well, that is awesome. You're a very inspiring guy. And I think I can see how, um, your mindset sort of let you weather this, this storm and it's it's good to see you you know saying that you're like jazz now you're happy and uh yeah. feeling good yeah that's that's awesome so where can people find you um yeah so i am uh i live on instagram in terms of social media um so yes yeah, so I, I do instagram i've got my personal page uh it's at uh, sam schaefer one so s-a-m-s-c-h-a-e-f-e-r and then just the number one and then if you're interested in more like the educational side of things, I'm still working on it. Um, so it's not like full, full go, but uh, I've already got a little bit of information out there. It's called Schaefer Adaptive Methods. Um, you can it's spelled the same as my last name, um, or you can go to my profile and you can, it'll be in my bio. Um, my, I've got some cool. good plans there. I, uh, I, I'm planning on learning how to translate all the stuff I'm talking about. I'm going to try to translate that for the rest of the community because I've got this really unique perspective. Again, like I said, I, I know what I know what a very sound deadlift is supposed to feel like. Um, that's of great value, and so if I can translate to how to do that on a prosthetic for more than just myself, now it actually means something versus just me, Sam getting to post a video of deadlift and some weight. It actually means that knowledge now means something uh, that I can share that stuff with people. So that that's those are my you know I've got some big goals there in terms of supporting and empowering the adaptive community through the Schaefer through Schaefer Adaptive Channel. That's awesome. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for taking your time to yeah, uh, sure. chat with us. And um, who knows when the world gets – I mean, it's the world's clearing up a little bit. Maybe we can uh, catch a deadlift session sometime. No, dude, that'd be sweet. No, I, uh, like I said, I appreciate the opportunity. It's it's stuff like this. You know, it's you know, people are like, you know, what can we do? What can we do? And I'm like, well, first off, thanks for asking. That's cool. And, uh, I, I, again, it's not anything special. It's just us getting – it's adaptive athletes getting opportunities to go on and be, be athletes or be coaches, be who they are instead of just being like – like you guys didn't ask me to come on and talk about how I'm missing a foot. So I appreciate the fact that I got to come in. I got to talk about coaching and impact and, you know, what do I want to do? And um, it's just th- those opportunities mean the world to everyone, 
not just adaptive athletes. So it's just, it's awesome to be, get, to get an opportunity like this to talk on a, on a outlet and share your platform. Well, it was awesome to have you on, man. Ladies yeah, and gentlemen, absolutely. brand new, brand new episode every single Wednesday and Friday. Thanks so much for listening. Give us a rating and review. Be sure to check it out. 3SB.co if you want to find about the gym and us. And I'm Silent Mike everywhere you want to find me. I am at the Jim McD on all the social media. This show is 50% facts, where percent is a word. 50 is just numbers. Check out 3SB.co, see what we got to sell there. And we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>